I'm going to use this example problem to illustrate both ray tracing and optical ray diagrams. And we're going to solve this problem using both methods. So go ahead and pause and read the question. There are two lenses. The first lens is converging. The second lens is diverging. And they're separated by 400 millimeters. Dimensions and refractive index are given for each lens rather than the focal length, even though they're thin lenses. It's common practice in optical design to not start with focal length or lens power, so the radii of curvature, both front and back surface, and the index of refraction of the glass are what you start with because those become variables. We'll calculate the resulting focal length of the lenses, and then we will proceed with an optical ray diagram, and then we'll solve this with ray tracing, which is a different thing. The first objective is to find the focal length of the lenses, which is the inverse of the power of the lenses. And to find the power of the lenses, we need to find the power of each surface. Altogether, there are four surfaces in this problem. First, find the power of the first surface. Power is the difference in the refractive indices between the two sides of the surface, divided by the radius of curvature of the surface in the paraxial limit. Given an index of refraction of the glass and the radius of curvature of the glass, we have the power of the first surface. The power of the second surface is found the same way, but the glass now is first, and then the error is next. So using n equals 1 for error, and n equals 1.517 for glass, n prime refers to the index after the interface, n refers to the index before the interface. The rays of curvature is also opposite in sine for surface 2, because it's concave, the radius is negative. If the surface were convex, then the radius is positive per our sine convention. From this, we can get the power of the thin lens. The focal length of lens number 1 is 1 over the sum of the powers, and we get 120 millimeters. If it's not a thin lens, you have to then account for the thickness t of the lens. But in the thin lens limit, the thickness goes to 0, and that's why we can just add the powers. Surface 3's power can be computed by the same approach. Now notice the radius of curvature is negative because it's concave, and surface 4 gives the same power, same sign, and then you add those together as well to get the net power, and the inverse of that is the focal length. So the focal length of lens 2 is minus 80 millimeters. So let's take those computed focal lengths, put them back in the diagram, put x's on the optic axis where those focal points reside, the object, we're told, is 240 millimeters to the left of the converging lens, and it has a height of 2 millimeters. We're taking ourselves in the praxial limit. So we'll get the same result, including magnification, regardless of what we choose for object height. It's common in optical ray diagrams to have a different scale for the vertical and the horizontal. So let's draw some rays. If a ray comes from the tip of the object, Parallel to the optic axis, it will go through the focal point of the converging lens after the lens. A ray that is always easy to draw is a chief ray because it goes right through the dead center of a thin lens. If it's a thick lens, it's more complicated. You drive the chief ray through the vertex of the front surface in that case. But for a thin lens, everything happens at the vertical dashed line, the principal plane. I won't bother drawing the focal ray. But you can imagine what it does. It goes from the tip of the object through the focal point, hits the lens, and emerges parallel. All of those three of those principal rays will converge at an image. It's a real image because it's formed from real light, and it's inverted. That real image from lens 1 becomes the object for lens 2. So let's draw some rays from this new object through lens number 2. I'm going to draw part of a ray here. It proceeds parallel to the optic axis until it hits the principal plane of lens 2. And then it goes off at some angle. It is, in fact, a diverging lens, so that is what it should do. At what angle does this ray proceed after the lens? To find it, you backtrack that ray to the focal point. This is, in fact, a parallel ray. So it comes in parallel, and then it needs to proceed to the focal point. Well, it can't proceed to this focal point. That would be a converging lens. It has to proceed to this focal point as a virtual ray, the dashed line and then the real light diverges outward. You can always draw a chief ray that goes from the tip of the object to the dead center of the thin lens. And now we have two rays, the parallel ray and the chief ray. Where they intersect, you have a new image. And that's the final image then of the system. It's inverted, and it's virtual. You know it's virtual because it's not formed from real light. This is a virtual 
part of the parallel ray that is being used to locate it. Now I have the benefit of doing this on a computer and I can take advantage of some of the very precise measuring techniques that are available with sketching in PowerPoint. So I measured this to be 54 millimeters where everything is scaled. So if the distance between these two lenses is 400, this distance right here comes out to 54 millimeters and that's scaling. It has a size with the same scaling as the object. When I measured the length of this blue arrow, I got 0.667, two-thirds of a millimeter. From that, we have a magnification. It's the height of the image divided by the height of the object. And we have a magnification then of minus 0.333, negative because it's inverted. Less than one, meaning it's small. So that's the solution by optical ray diagram. The solution by ray tracing is based on something called the paraxial ray tracing equations. The field of practical optical design begins with these two equations, praxial ray tracing equation 1 and praxial ray tracing equation 2. They're introduced in all optics textbooks. For example, in HEC 4th edition, chapter 6, you'll find these two equations. They're equations 612 and 613, if you happen to have that book. It flies right by you when you take a general optics course, but optical design begins with these two equations. What they say is that the index of refraction after an interface times the angle relative to the horizontal equals the index before the interface times the angle relative to the horizontal before the interface minus the height above the optic axis times the power. Praxial ray tracing equation number two says that the height after a translation equals the height before a translation plus the distance of translation times the angle relative to the horizontal. This is only correct in the praxial limit when tangent of u equals u, when the angles are small. Praxial ray tracing equation number one is just Snell's law using the angle relative to the horizontal instead of the angle relative to the normal. And praxial ray tracing equation number two is just the equation for a straight line. And we're going to use them right now to construct what optical designers call a YNU spreadsheet. YNU, because those are the names of the variables involved here. So let's go to that spreadsheet that I have made for a two lens system. Let's go through all of the cells that are involved here. The first five rows give you background on the system. The next two rows deal with this parallel ray that is emitted from the object and follow it through. And the next two rows follow through the chief ray. Begin with information about the system. The object is described by its location relative to the first surface. And the problem we've been dealing with, it's 240 millimeters. And the index of refraction in the object space. If it's air, then it's just one. And then in object space, you also have a marginal ray, in this case, the parallel ray that's emitted from the tip of the object. You have to define a height that you're starting with. That height is two millimeters. The launch angle of that marginal or parallel ray is zero degrees. And so U prime is the angle that this parallel ray makes relative to the horizontal before it arrives at this interface and at zero radians. The chief ray also begins at a height of 2 millimeters. It has to make an angle, which I'm finding with an equation, this 2 millimeter distance divided by this 240 millimeter distance. Technically, it should be the arctangent, but in the small angle limit, the arctangent of an angle is the angle. When the rays arrive at lens 1, they will refract and they will translate. So let's describe surface one. First, it has a ray of curvature, which we input 124 millimeters, and then has a curvature, which is just the inverse of the radius of curvature. The thickness is the distance between surface one and surface two. So for a thin lens, we'll take that to be zero. And then the refractive index is that of the glass we're given. From that, you can calculate a surface power using the expressions that I described in the previous slides. And in this case, it's the difference in these refractive indices divided by the radius of curvature, or rather, as I have here, multiplied by the curvature, which is the inverse. Now, when that ray arrives at this surface, it has a height of 2 millimeters. Even though there's an equation that goes into surface 1 marginal parallel ray height y, it will always be whatever the object is at because there is no angle. You'll notice that it only will change if there is a value in cell C9, which is the launch angle. 
So that is exactly the same as salciate, two millimeters. But after the refraction at surface one, you will have a new angle. And you can calculate that from praxial ray tracing equation number one, which is programmed into this cell. You can compare praxial ray tracing equation one to the Excel formula that I have here and convince yourself. The chief ray now it has to be at zero when it arrives at the lens, because that's what a chief ray does. So it is zero if you start at two millimeters and then add this thickness distance times this angle, you should get zero. And we, you know, we calculated the angle based on that assumption, so yeah, you'll get zero. The chief ray does have a change of angle at the interface because after all there's refraction. But it corrects when it gets past the other interface and for a thin lens it's irrelevant. But it's calculated with praxial ray tracing equation number one. So that is the angle that the chief ray makes inside the glass. In principle, if the glass actually had thickness it would matter. The ray arrives at surface two, which is described as having a radius of minus 124 millimeters. Hence a curvature of one over that. Now thickness of 400 means 400 millimeters from surface two to surface three. N of one means that the index after surface two is one, it's air. And the power is calculated using the difference in indices before and after the surface multiplying the curvature. The marginal ray is still at two millimeters only because it's a very thin lens and so we don't consider the transfer inside the glass. But after the ray emerges from the lens, it will have an angle calculated from paraxial ray tracing equation number one. And it's the same Excel formula as the previous column, just raised up by one letter on each, each column. The chief ray is going to still be at zero right here, but now we'll have a new angle calculated from paraxial ray tracing equation number two. No surprise, it's the same angle that the chief ray originally had. That should be the case, that it emerges like that. So the rays then proceed to surface three. The description of surface three is given a radius minus 82.7. It's a lens of zero thickness, but the glass does have an index. You can calculate the surface power with our equation. And then the marginal ray upon arrival down here someplace, you can just follow it with your finger down here to where it hits the lens. It strikes a height of 4.67 millimeters below the optic axis. And after it enters the lens, it has an angle of minus 0 0.03 radians calculated with the praxial ray tracing equation number one. If you follow the brown line here, the chief ray arrives at the second lens at a height of 3.33 millimeters below the optic axis. It emerges from surface three into the glass with an angle of minus 0 0.019 radians. Then at surface four, the marginal ray comes out. The height doesn't change because the lens is thin, but after the marginal ray emerges from the lens, it's going at an angle of minus 0 0.075 radians per the praxial ray tracing equation number one. The chief ray is still at minus 3.33 millimeters, and it will have a exit angle of minus 0 0.050 radians. Okay, so that's following the rays all the way to surface four. They emerge from surface four. They converge at this point right here. At the final image, the chief ray and the marginal ray will be at the same height because an image is forming there. Take praxial ray trace equation two. For the image, you have the chief ray, call it y sub c, has to equal the marginal ray, call it y sub m. The chief ray at surface four plus the angle relative to the horizontal at surface four after refraction times the distance. We'll just call the distance x. And that has to equal the marginal ray's height at surface four plus the angle relative to the horizontal of the marginal ray times x. So x, which is the distance from surface four to the image, is the height of the marginal ray at surface four minus the height of the chief ray at surface four divided by the angle difference. That's the working equation to locate the final image. So that equation is put into cell B14 and an image distance of minus 53.3 millimeters is calculated. Final image is 53.3 millimeters to the left of surface four, before surface four. Now we remember from the ray diagram, we got 54. 
pretty good. And a magnification can be found by taking the ratio of that marginal ray height at the final location. That would be cell B15 divided by the 2 millimeter initial height. And you get 0.332. Now with the ray diagram, we got minus 0.333. So again, pretty good. Now the ray diagram was done with the precision of a computer's drawing tool. If you do it with pencil on paper, it's going to be far less accurate. That's doing this with thin lenses. This can be done with thick lenses as well. Suppose we didn't have zero thickness. So here we had zero in these two cells, D5 and F5. Let's not have zero. Here's an alternative problem. We make lens one seven millimeters thick and lens two is five millimeters thick. Keep all of the radii of curvature the same. We'll, we'll keep the vertex of surface 2 and the vertex of surface 3 400 millimeters apart. The object will remain 240 millimeters in front of the vertex of surface 1. The only difference is these thicknesses. So I'll put in 7 millimeters for lens 1 thickness and 5 millimeters for lens 2 thickness. Now the image distance is very similar, 54.8 millimeters in front of surface 4. The magnification is almost minus 0.333, but it's minus 0.327. Some interesting things that you learn is that the thickness of lens 1 has virtually no effect. I can make it 20 millimeters and you'll see virtually no change. It's out there in these far significant figures. However, the thickness of lens 2 is more important. If I made that really thick, you'll see these guys changing a little bit more. The reason why is because when we change the thickness of lens 1, we're not changing the object distance to the vertex. We're not changing the separation between the lenses. And so the final image ends up remarkably in the same place and the magnification barely changed. However, if you change the thickness of lens 2, you definitely change the location of the final image and its magnification. But with this tool, you could play around with the effects of thickness. Uh, one lesson learned is thickness has very little effect on lens performance. And this is important if you start to do optimization in your optical design. Optimizers and optical system design software will make the thicknesses enormous if you let them. And it doesn't matter. So usually it's a good idea if you constrain all glass thicknesses to realistic quantities and allow everything else to optimize in order to get your aberrations as small as possible. So hopefully that was uh, helpful in showing you the difference between optical ray diagrams and optical ray tracing. There are two different approaches to problems and they give the same answer in the praxial limit. Okay, thanks for watching.